The scripture reading is from Colossians, second chapter. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Here ends the reading. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, I tell you, you must have had a hard week. You guys seem a little quiet this morning, just a little quiet, huh? A little hot out there, huh? Maybe it took a little bit out of us. Well, it's our third week of our sermon series. What we've conveyed to you is that we believe when St. Paul was writing to the Christians in Colossa, that he had three especially important messages for them. And not just important messages for them, but those messages are just as important for us today. And to review just real quickly, week one, we said that the key to life is having that dual commitment as the two most important things in your life. And that is to, to have a deep trust and belief in Jesus Christ. And then also to have a, just an amazing outreaching love, caring, compassionate love towards other people. The second week we said that, you know, we're challenged not to back off from believing in and knowing in who Jesus truly is. We mentioned that he is the unique son of God. And what that means is that Jesus is the one, he's God who created us and who has reconciled us back to the father and the one who sustains us and who will bring all creation unto himself. And so this week, the message is true wisdom. True wisdom is found in Jesus Christ. And that's where we can find the, really the meaning for the answers of life. In regards to that, I want to start off with a term today called relativism. Relativism. What that states is that there is no absolute truth. No such thing as an absolute truth. There is no such thing as absolute morality. What's really pushed in our day and time is that you may have your opinion and I can have my opinion. And both of our opinions have the same weight. Both of our opinions, you know, have the same value. And, and you see people saying, look, I have a right to my opinion and you have no right to tell me that my opinion is off base or that my opinion is wrong. How can it be wrong if it's my opinion? Well, maybe I can't tell you that your opinion is right or wrong, but I believe that God can. I mean, how in the world do we think that all of a sudden we have a corner on the market when it comes to wisdom? How in the world has it become popular that we think that, well, we can never be wrong or be misled or misunderstand things? I believe there is such a thing as a right or a wrong opinion. And I, you know, I don't know if if what I speak is truth or what I feel is wise or, or what I think is correct until I compare it to and weigh it against the wisdom of God. I don't know if what was said at the Republican convention this past week or if what's going to be said at the Democratic convention this week is truthful or wise or correct or, 
I don't know if what's said on Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, or I don't even know what's, if what is thought in my mind is truthful or wise or correct until I compare it and weigh it against the wisdom of God. So where do we find God's wisdom? Remember last week we said with Jesus being the unique son of God, when we see him, we see God, all that God thinks, all that God knows, all that God feels. So we go to Jesus Christ. Paul says in the scripture, my goal is that you may be encouraged in heart and united in love. And look at the scripture on the screen. He says, so that you are going to have complete understanding, he says to the Colossians, an understanding into the mysteries of God. Where do you find understanding into the mysteries of God? He's going to say in Christ, that in him, that's where you have hidden the wisdom and the knowledge of God. When you look at the word hidden here, what Paul is telling us is is that is where wisdom can be found. That is where truth is revealed. That is where it is available to everyone. And a lot of times when we think of something being hidden, we've played games with people or people have had fun with us and they've hidden things from us. And sometimes things are so well hidden that they're almost impossible to find. That's not what Paul's saying here. In the Greek, the word hidden literally means that's where truth has been placed. That's where it's placed. That's why the Bible says, Matthew 7, 7, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Ask and the answers will be given to you. That's why James in chapter one, verse five says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God who gives liberally to all people. So we go to Christ, right? That's where we find wisdom and knowledge. Now let's understand exactly what Paul's saying here about knowledge and wisdom. First knowledge, in the Greek, it's called gnosis. And what this means is that when you have knowledge, you have the ability to grasp the truth when you see it and when you hear it. And the Greek word really gets here to almost emphasize that's something that you start to have instinctively that when we see something in our world or when we hear someone say something, because we are in Christ, we start to develop an instinctively godly spirit to right away be able to say, hey, that's truth. Or hey, that's not truth. Or that's according to God's goodness. Or that's not according to God's goodness. So Paul's saying when you're in Christ, you start to develop knowledge. You're able to grasp the truth when you hear it and when you see it. And then he says wisdom. Wisdom then is the ability to take that truth and to lift it up, to to advocate it and to endorse it and even then to kind of implement it in your life. There's a theologian by the name of Vance Hobner who says wisdom, wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. God says, when you are in Christ, you're going to start to have the ability to recognize truth and then have the ability to lift it up, elevate it, praise it, and then even to implement it into your life. And that's why we we just consistently and constantly, isn't it why we do this as a Christian community? Why we say it's so important to center our focus on Jesus and to ground ourselves in his word. Why it's so important to read the Bible and uh, to study the Bible, meditate upon it, even to memorize it. Why it's so important to, to grow with God daily, to be on a journey with him, to allow God to take us somewhere tomorrow where we weren't you know, today because we have grown in him. Why it's important to stay humble, to, to realize what, I don't know everything and I need to know more. Even to be, can we be hungry and thirsty for more? when it comes to being with God and to be able to ask questions. You know, the old phrase, curiosity killed the cat. It's not that way with being a Christian. We need to ask, we need to be curious. God gave us, you know, a brain and he gave us minds so that we can learn. And let's remember the process of our relationship with him. Yeah, it begins by receiving our Lord and all that he's done for us in the cross and resurrection. But once we're in that relationship, It involves being open to, and folks, not being dragged along or something we have to do, but being excited about being discipled. 
I don't have to be discipled in Jesus. But you and I, we, we get to be discipled, to, to grow with him and to learn with him and to move forward with him in our life. And when we move forward with God, boy, you know who gets blessed? Not just us, but the people around us in life. They get so blessed when you and I are discipled more to become a stronger follower with Jesus. And I think the third phase is we recognize that the only way that that discipleship can happen is that we are open again and again to the power of God's Holy Spirit having leadership in our life. I would say this to you, boy, when, we, when you and I are in God's word enough, I don't know if there's ever a time you can be enough, but I wanna say it this way. If you and I are in God's word enough, we can start to develop an instinctive, godly spirit. Because when, when God is informing us and when we are growing with God and we can develop that type of spiritual attitude and vision, we can start to see things as God begins to see them. And we can start to, to really know what our, if our belief and our feelings and our thinking is in accordance to what God desires for us. I wanna ask you this. Who do you go to for wisdom in your life? I mean, who do you go to for wise counsel in your life? And you might say to me, well, sometimes I go to my spouse or sometimes I may go to a parent you know, even no matter how old you get, I, I'm, I'm a pretty independent guy, pretty confident, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess to you here. Every once in a while, you know, I walk into that office that's next to mine, and I don't say, hey, Pastor John, do you have a minute? I say, hey, Dad, do you have a minute? And I look for a little bit of wise counsel. There are times when we look to a friend that, that we really trust. But I want to ask you this. Where is God in that conversation with you and I? I have found with me, before I go to anyone else, whatever the circumstances is, if I ever talk to God just a little bit first, boy, it makes a big difference. Or once I've talked to someone, to go to God and, and allow God to help me to evaluate even the, the advice and the, the direction that someone else has given me. Even when I go to someone and I know, boy, they're a godly person, they, they seek God's will, to come back to God. I'm gonna ask you, do you involve God? and your daily search for wisdom and truth in your life. Where's he in the conversation? And Paul says this is important because number two in your outline, he points out, boy, it is so easily, not just for the Colossians of the first century, but for you and I to be deceived, deceived. Take a look at the scripture again. Paul says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, and to me, this is what's important, continue to live your lives in him. It's one thing to begin with Jesus Christ. Isn't it another thing for us to what? Make sure we don't fade away from him? As we go through different seasons of life, as we face different challenges, ups and downs, you know, as we're not always feeling like we're on a mountaintop, well, I tell you, sometimes we got to make sure, how do we continue to live in him? Well, Paul says, look, you continue to live in him by being rooted and built up in him. Now, why was Paul saying this to them? We, you just briefly mentioned last week, remember, false teachers were coming into their community. And we're leading them away from a right relationship with God. These teachers were teaching them that Jesus by himself was not sufficient for a right relationship with God. That faith alone wasn't sufficient for a right relationship with God. You may have remembered in the scripture that Karen read, Paul said about being circumcised in your heart. There were people now who are saying, you not only need to believe in Jesus, but just like the, the Jews before us, you got to go back and be physically circumcised and that has to happen, and you need to have belief, and then you'll be right with God. Paul's saying, no, 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 you just, faith, trust, believe in the promises. There were people who were saying, well, we gotta go back to many of those festivals and a lot of the laws that we used to look at before. Remember the Pharisees, 10 commandments? They made 630 some out of the 10. People were wanting to go back to, these are the things you've gotta do to be right with God. Paul's saying, no. There were false teachers who were saying, against what we preached last week, that Jesus wasn't unique, that he's just one of many revelations to God. 
There were others saying that it was necessary to know other divine powers in addition to him. People were starting to, to get involved in astrology. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? They didn't have an 800 number, but they were getting involved in astrology. And there were people worshiping angels. So Paul's saying, be careful, don't be deceived. How can you not be deceived? He says, be rooted in Christ. When I think of rooted, I think of just like a week and a half ago or so, a storm had come through. And Jennifer said, hey, one of the tomato plants is over in the garden. And even though we kind of had that metal cage around it, you know, it was over. So I, I went out, I put the metal cage back in and I pulled the plant back up and I took the twine and pulled it in the other direction so that the plant would stand straight. But none of that would have helped because when the plant went over, about half of its roots had come what? Out of the ground. So what I did is I went around it and I just kind of softly you know, pushed it back down then used my hands and pushed it back down, put some other dirt around it because I knew that the roots had to be in the ground to get nourishment for the plants. And when you look at this text, it's talking about really the Greek words getting at, you know, about a tree, a large tree, a deep rooted tree, and that it finds its nourishment when it's in the ground. And Paul's saying it's the same way for you and I. We've got to be deep rooted in our Lord so that we might not be deceived. It reminds me, and it's going to be on the screen, Psalm number one. Look what David writes. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. How do you learn how to follow God? How do you stay rooted with God? Well, you spend time with him. You meditate with him. You, we, what we've said, to be in his word. And the more we delight in God's presence, the psalmist is saying, the more faithful we can become. And the more we will not allow those who, what, disagree with us or want to ridicule us or lead our attitude and our beliefs away from God so that we start to become separated from him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. We cannot allow our relationships with the world and our relationships with others to pull us away from being Christ-centered, charactered people. Right? We have to make sure that instead of people pulling us away from Christ, that the people that we are around, that we're pulling them closer to Christ. Instead of people lessening our Christian character, we need to be helping them to have greater Christian character. And, and this is serious business, because look at the next scripture. It says, Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive. Listen to that, that no one takes you captive because of hollow and deceptive philosophies, which depend on human tradition, and the spiritual forces of this world. It can be enticing, he says. It can be seductive, and they can come after you. I think one of the most deceptive things that is presented to us as Christians and to the church is to say that a sort of moderate faith, a moderate faith is okay. What is a moderate faith? What's a faith that is... Well, it kind of gets calmed down. It, it kind of decreases in us. A faith that kind of is lessened and becomes diminished, a little bit weaker. A faith that really, well, daily isn't as, as important to us anymore. I think that's a great deception that's presented to us because when it comes to we who are within the church, we who are within the church, I think there's, there are times when when we settle for a moderate faith, you know, when you poll people, I think it's 45 and older, and you ask them if they're active in worship, if they have an active worship life, people 45 and older uh, who say yes, literally usually worship three out of four Sundays a month or four out of four Sundays a month. But those who are under that 45-year-old line if they're asked, do you, are you active in worship, and they answer yes, the average attendance is about one in every six weeks. The generations that are coming behind me, 
I think they're, they're starting to get comfortable, are they not? And sometimes we, doesn't, it's not an age thing, we can too, but you start to get comfortable with a moderate faith. Or there are people, there's a study I read recently about people who had left a church, and when they were asked why did they leave a church, three out of four, 75% said because they didn't feel that they were cared for or loved by anybody else there. And that, that struck me because that's exactly where people should feel loved for and cared for is in the church. But oftentimes we leave the church, we don't feel loved because what? We're not connected. And if you come to church and that's about it, I'm going to say that you're living a moderate faith. If you're not going beyond that and starting what? To connect with people, make friendships with people. Start to make relationships with people. Start to serve and to help, allow God to help people through you. You see, those are the types of things that take you beyond just kind of a faith that starts to get weak and a faith that is settled, a faith that's moderate. And when we look at those outside, let's say the church, when we look at people that, let's just say it, people who aren't here with us, and what I mean by that is, you know, there are certain people who aren't here with us that, boy, you really would like for them to be here with us. And they're not here because of, let's say, an illness or other thing that's keeping them away. They're not here because they're really not where they need to be with God. And you'll oftentimes hear people in that circumstance say, well, you know, I believe in God, but I just don't go to worship. And I want to say something to you. That is nowhere in the Bible. What I read in the Bible, if you love somebody, what do you do? You spend time with them and you get close to them. And so you see the people in our own families, the people, many of the people we love very much, what did they convince themselves of? Of a moderate faith. And they're deceived. They're deceived. Paul says, be careful of that. And so we really need to think about, boy, how do we talk with our family? How do we reach out to them? How do we invite them? Because you know what? We don't want them to be in that type of relationship, but we want them to be in a real life-saving relationship with Christ. And so when we look at those types of things, well, what's the answer? I would say to number three, I put down today, well, I think we've got to apply the wisdom of Christ. And what that means is, and I just put in big words, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. And so if you look at the next slide, I believe I have 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, verses 11 through 16 up there. It says, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, hold on to that. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. But Paul goes on. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. So what does that mean? God's thoughts have come to us through his Spirit so that we may understand what God has freely given. Paul's telling us that true wisdom comes to the believer when they are guided by the Holy Spirit. And that through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you see, when we start to get in conversation with God and close to him, God starts to share his plans and his thoughts and his actions with us. We're kind of brought into that inner circle. And one of the great ways to be involved in that, I would say, is, is through prayer. Prayer is a great example of that. There's a U2 song. I love the band, the rock band U2. And... Um, I can't remember the name of the song, but one of the lines in the song says, if you want to touch heaven, boy, you better get on your knees. And I think that's true. And when we get on our knees and when we're open to God, and God starts to share his plans and his thoughts to us in a world that has confusing messages, in a world that's saying so many things are truth. And I believe this firmly as I read the word. God has something to say. God has wisdom to give for every area of our lives. God has something to say about our language, right? How we should talk to each other, the words we should use towards each other, how our words are used, whether to build each other up or tear each other down. God has something to say about respecting authority. Not only as a young person being raised in the home and respecting authority, but how you and I respect authority as we go out into the world. God has something to say about how you and I should conduct ourselves within the relationship of marriage. And he has something to say about how you and I, whether we're 20 or whether we're 60, God has something to say about how we involve ourselves intimately 
outside of marriage. And God has something to say even about how you and I use our money, how you and I prioritize our money, how you and I are gracious towards others with our money. Remember years ago, and maybe we stopped using it because it was overused. Remember years ago, the bracelets and everybody was wearing the WWJD bracelets. Remember that? What would Jesus do? Well, I want to challenge you a little bit differently, kind of use that, but differently. I would, I would like to say WWJ, and then it can be different. You know, this week, as you go out in your life, in every moment you have, every person you meet, every circumstance you have, wouldn't it be great if we could just stop and say, okay, in this moment, what would Jesus think? Or maybe, what would Jesus say? Or possibly, yeah, what would Jesus do? Because when we do that, if we stop and say, okay, God, what's faithful here in this moment, we really open the door for the Holy Spirit to come in with God's wisdom and guidance. When we're in a conversation with our spouse or we're giving advice to our teenager or talking to someone who may not be 100% happy with us or maybe they're not being 100% nice to us or even being fair to us, what would Jesus say? And maybe more than what would Jesus say in our technological world, when you're interacting with someone, what would Jesus write? What would Jesus email? What would Jesus tweet? What would Jesus text? What type of pictures would Jesus send? When you're making a decision at work or interacting with someone at work or making a decision that affects people close to you or family members, maybe even making a choice that has clear moral or ethical impact Yeah, what would Jesus do? And when you're contemplating what you believe or how you are to feel, hey, I even go this far. In October, it's gonna be great. We're gonna preach a four-week series on is God a Democrat or Republican? (laughs) Biblical, Biblical guidance during unsure times. It's gonna be great. But I'm serious, up and down the line, how in the world would Jesus vote in our day and time? Think about it. We have to seek God's counsel and wisdom in every aspect of our life. So where do we find truth? In Jesus Christ. And when you and I are in Jesus Christ, we begin to grasp and recognize the truth. I believe it starts to become a kind of a God instinctive spirit within us. And when we open ourselves up to grow in his truth and apply it to our lives, Boy, it really becomes a blessing, not only in what we think and in what we say, but in what we do. Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious will, but we not only thank you for your will, but we thank you that your will is revealed to us, that your will can be placed in our heart and in our minds. And we just pray this week that we would be a little bit more conscious of the working of your Holy Spirit within us, that we would get more connected to your word and your wisdom, that we on a daily basis would open up more to where you minister to us, and that we too, Lord, would would not be deceived, not so easily deceived by the arguments of our world, but to stay faithful to the revelation that you have most clearly given, Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.